I will begin. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day, and I just thank you for the students. Again, Lord, we thank you for your many, uh, your many blessings to us, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, let me, uh, so uh, in my notes, um, I prove, uh, so we're talking about determinants again, of course. And so the big, um, uh, identity, if you will, is that the determinant of A times B is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B for A and B. I mean, truthfully, if you just have a commutative ring, um, with identity, you got a couple square matrices. This identity, in fact, holds for, for those. I, I suppose, technically speaking, um, my notes probably really only prove it for a field. Uh, the proof of this identity involves a um, careful examination of elementary matrices and row reductions. So it's rather, it's rather technical. It's rather involved. And I'm not going to go through it in class. I'd encourage you to read it, especially if you're a math major. It's something you should read. Um, but going forward, what you really need to know is that the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants and what that means. Um, now, it's often the case that um, circular arguments are easier. So in some sense, some of the things I'm about to show you are circular because, honestly, they kind of rely on the proof I'm omitting. And that's part of the reason that the proof I'm about to show you is easier. But for us, I, don't, I will not expect you to replicate the proof that the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. As in my notes, like I said, I'd just like you to read it. Um, so uh, you, you all are, will be, of course, responsible for what I'm about to show you in class. So here, let's, let's get to it. So this, this will work for us. This is going to be um, proposition 5.3.5 in my notes. I am uh, adapting the proof um, with the understanding that we already know the product of the determinants is the, you know, determinant of the product. So here we go. And I did half this proof last time. So we have A is square matrix over a field, right? Then A inverse exists if and only if the determinant of A is not equal to zero, all right? So both directions of this biconditional strongly depend today, my proof will depend on the product, uh, the, the determinant product identity. And again, I'm aware of the circularity of my arguments in the sense that I have not proved that identity. There is a non-circular argument given in the notes if you just read it. <laughs> okay. But here it is. Proof. You guys know a circular argument is a argument which relies on what you're trying to prove, right? Okay, so let's suppose A inverse exists, right? Then A, A inverse is equal to I, right? Thus, the determinant of A times the determinant of A inverse is equal to the determinant of I by the, you know, the identity I'm not proving. And the determinant of i we worked out last time is 1, right? So that implies immediately that the determinant of a is not equal to 0, right? Because we can't have a product of 0 and something else give us non-zero, right? So basic property of, of, of numbers. I went over this last time. I hope it still makes sense today, right? Let's go the other direction. That I did not do last time. OK, so what we're going to do. Suppose the determinant of A is not equal to 0, right? Now I'm going to rely on some of the things we've done with elementary matrices, right? What do we know? Recall there exist E1, E2, da 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 da, E k elementary, right? 
such that what? <laughs> such that we could call their product E, let's say, E is equal to EK dot 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 E2 to E1, right? And what's the deal with this E? What's it do for us? Multiplication of A on the Yields what? E times A equals to what? What's that? I. We don't know that yet. That is, I mean, that's really assuming the point. <laughs> I, I think we, all we can say is the reduced echelon form of A from the outset, right? Okay. But then what can I do? Let me call this thing star to give it a name. Take the determinant of star. What do you get? Taking the determinant of star, we find the determinant of E times the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of the reduced to echelon form of A. Now we're assuming that we're under the assumption right now that the determinant of A is non-zero, right? How about the determinant of E? Well, E is the product of elementary matrices, right? We have proved previously that that's what? Invertible. So by part one of my proof, we already know that the determinant of E is also non-zero, right? So this is also non-zero, since E inverse exists. In fact, you know what it is. It's, uh, it's E1 inverse, E2 inverse, da da da, EK inverse, not that the details terribly matter to us. There it is, that's the inverse of E. We talked about this before. So you have the product of two non-zero numbers. What's this say about the determinant of the reduced echelon form of A? Consequently, the determinant of the reduced row echelon form of A is not equal to zero. Do you agree? But A is square. which implies that the reduced to echelon form of A must be the identity. See, if the reduced to echelon form of A was not the identity, then there has to be a row of zeros because it's a square matrix, right? A square matrix either reduces to E1 through EN as pivots, or there's some column which is not a pivot, which means there's some row of zeros. But if there's a row of zeros by the property of determinants that we looked at last class, the determinant's zero. If you have a row of zeros, you can expand on that row and get determinant zero. Does that make sense? So the determinant, the reduced echelon form of A must be I. And that then, by our previous work, implies that A is invertible. Right? Referring to the previous proofs that we did in here. Ah, so we have now, uh, remember that theorem? What was our theorem? For a, a n by n matrix over a field, the following are equivalent, right? Number one, a inverse exists in the sense what? A inverse A is equal to I, is equal to uh, AA inverse, right? And then what was the other characterization, characterization we had? A is AX equals to zero if and only if what? Another characterization of invertible matrix, only the zero solution is the zero, right? Only x equal to zero solves the homogeneous problem. 
right? That was the other characterization we have. What was another characterization we had? 3 AX equals to B has unique solution for each B, right? Sorry. <laughs> uh, what else do we have? Another way we could say it was A was the product of elementary matrices, right? And what can we add to this list today? Yeah, determinant of A is not equal to zero. In fact, we could add a six. The columns of A form linearly independent set. In fact, from our work already, we could add a seven. Rows of A form linearly independent set. Both of those follow from just an examination of our characterization of linear independence as, as being, you know, if we take a C1 times the first vector plus da 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 plus Cn times the last vector equal to zero, we only get the zero solution. That's just another language for Ax equal to zero. Remember, Ax equal to zero is nothing more than a linear combination of the columns of A. So, you know, if I traded my x for a C, it would be just manifest what I'm saying. You know, suppose we take AC equal to zero, where the C is C1, C2, dot, 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 CN, right? This is nothing more than C1 column one of A plus dot, 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 plus CN column N of A. So don't be, don't be fooled. AX equal to zero is nothing more than the linear independence condition on the columns of A. If that only has the zero solution, that means that the columns are linearly independent. How do I get the rows? That follows because the transpose of the determinant. I mean, we have this identity, one of the identities for determinant that I will not prove in here is that the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A transpose. So if you have a linear dependence of the rows, that implies the linear dependence of the columns, right? And so if you sort through these ideas, we can tack on seven. Wow, so many different ways to characterize linear, uh, you know, invertibility of a matrix, right? And this list grows as the semester goes on. There's another five or six things we'll add to this by the end of the semester. Any questions? All right. So I would point out that these arguments I'm giving to you, they're pretty easy to follow if you just sort through them for yourself. And the reason they're easier than my notes is because I'm assuming a giant technical result, namely that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. This is a vastly simplifying assumption. That's not an easy fact to come by. And when you assume it, it makes everything fall into place easier. That said, here we go, Kramer's rule. So engineers tend to like this thing. It is very limited in its application in the following sense. If AX equals to B is a system of N equations in N unknowns, all right? In other words, that's just a way of me saying A is square, right? A is n by n over some field. Almost always we'll take the field to be the real numbers. But this works over the rationals or z mod 2 or what, pick, your, pick your poison, any field you like. Um, then, um, oh, sorry, important condition such that what? The determinant of A is not equal to zero, right? Then, x equal to x1, x2, dot, 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 dot xn, um, where we define um, x1 to be the determinant of a1 
over determinant of a, x2, the determinant of a2 over the determinant of a, the dot, dot, dot xn, the determinant of a sub n over the determinant of a, um, solves ax equals to b. Where a sub n, oh, let's say a sub j is the matrix A, with the jth column of A replaced with B. Let me, let me just be explicit to make sure you guys follow what I'm saying. So what would A1 be? So we, we replace the first column of A with B. What's the second column? Well, usual column 2 of A, right? I better not use A sub 2 for the second column of A here. That would be confusing, wouldn't it? So we're using this A sub 2 a sub n to rep for these modified modifications of the matrix A. If it bothers you that I've used A sub 1, A sub 2, da, 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 for the columns of A elsewhere, if that bothers you, you could do something like put a hat on all these. I don't know. You know, whatever. Use a different notation. Call them Pac-Man sub 1, Pac-Man sub 2, whatever. I'm going to call them what I have in the notes, which is A1 through AN, which is not a reserve notation for me. I mean, it's reserved for this discussion, but not more generally. So there's A1. What would A2 be? That'd be column 1 of A. Then you put B in the second column. The third column has column 3 of A, and then so forth. Right? A sub n, it's basically just, you know, column 1 of A all the way on out to column n minus 1 of A, right? and then B in the last, the last column. These are the A1 through AN, which we use to formulate Kramer's rule. Okay? Now let me, let me prove to you that Kramer's rule really does work. It's kind of sneaky. This proof I got out of Lay's linear algebra. I like it. It's not very motivated, but uh, it does give a convincing argument, so I'm going to show it to you. So here's the proof. So what we're going to do is suppose that AX equals to B. All right? Suppose that X is what we're looking for. Do I know that exists? Is that a reasonable assumption? Am I building everything on a house of, you know, on sand? Not really, right? If, a is, if the determinant of A if I'm assuming the determinant of A is non-zero, I know that the inverse exists, so in fact, I know that X is equal to A inverse B as, you know, the determinant of A is not equal to zero. But the, the existence is not all I want here. I actually want a formula, which is Kramer's rule. Okay, so anyway, suppose X is the answer that we're trying to describe. <sighs> Consider then... <clears throat> a times the following matrix. So what we do is we put E1 and then da, 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 Ej minus 1 um, B Oh, I'm sorry, not B. X um, da, 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 oh, Ej, um, Ej plus 1 da, 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 En Alright? So this is, this is a n by n matrix where I put x in the jth column, and I put the standard basis in the usual order in all the other columns. I mean, we can do this. You might ask why. I mean, the proof is in the pudding, I suppose. Um, proof in the pudding has become a strangely political statement. 
the later years of a certain comedian's life. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Ah, all right. Um, okay, so let's work out what this is. This is equal to what? What's, so this has got, you got AE1, right? Column by column, right? Da, 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 AEJ minus 1. AX, right? AEJ plus 1. Da, 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 AEN. Now we've, 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 we've talked about this a fair amount. That's column 1, right? That's column J minus 1. What's AX? By assumption, it's B, right? Then we got column J plus 1. Da -da -da, column N of A. What is that? That's, yeah? Yeah, it's AJ, right? This is the matrix A with all the columns except for the jth one, where the jth one's replaced by B. That is. In the statement of the theorem, that's the a sub j, right? This is exactly a sub j. So what we have just earned the right to say is that a times this funny matrix e1 dot 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 ej minus 1 x, you know, ej plus 1 dot 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 en, well, that's equal to a sub j, right? Focus your attention on that matrix with all the, you know, the standard basis columns. If we look at this matrix, what can you tell me, what can you tell me about row J? What would happen if we expand on row J? Think about expanding that matrix on row J. The, uh, expand on row J of this. Is, it's all zeros, right? Is there any non-zero entry in like E1? Right, I mean, the only thing that has a non-zero entry in that is the X1, right? Because everything, there is no EJ in any column, except for that Jth column. And even there, there's not an EJ, there's an X, right? So we hit XJ as you expand across row J, right? So we have XJ, times the determinant of, you know, well, it's not E1 anymore either, is it? It's, it's E1 bar, right? It's, it's E2 bar. Da, 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 da. It's, it's EJ minus 1 bar. It's, and then what happens once you get past that, that Jth column? Because you're, you're deleting, if you think about the row expansion, you're deleting that row of zeros, right? You're changing them from n vectors to n minus 1 vectors in the submatrix. So what happens is after that, they get shifted up. So really, you've got Ej here, bar, En minus 1 bar. And what about the, what about the expansion, x sub j? I mean, I, we need to think about the plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. What, what, is, what is the sign in the, uh, the cofactor expansion? Minus 1 to the what? Maybe you haven't thought about this. You know, the, I, I told you guys last time, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, et cetera, right? So what's the sign? What's the, what's the rule for the sign in the ijth component? What, what sign do we do? Minus 1 to the what to get the sign for the ijth component? What is it? i plus j, right? That is the sign we put here. Check it out. Like 1, 1 is 1 plus 1, which is 2 then 1, 2 gives you minus, then 1, 3 gives you plus, and so forth. When the sum 
of the indices is even, we put a plus. When the sum of the indices is odd, we put a minus. That's this pattern. This is in the jj spot. So the mi it's minus 1 to the j plus j. It's minus 1 to the j plus j, which of course is minus 1 to the 2j, otherwise known as 1. And so <laughs> this is all just xj. Because what, what's in the green there? Well, that's nothing more than the n minus 1 identity matrix. The determinant of that is 1. So what I'm trying to sell you on, guys, here, is if we look at this equation, let me give it a name. Let's call it, uh, how about star star? If we look at star star, the determinant of star star yields what? It yields the determinant of A. And what I was, that whole just long diatribe I gave to you was just to argue that the determinant of the matrix next to A works out to just the jth component of X. And that's equal to the determinant of A sub J. And that folks is Kramer's rule. X sub J is equal to the determinant of A sub J over the determinant of A. By the way, that has to be, I mean, the solution's unique also, so I know I have confidence in that formula not being a different solution than what I'm looking for or something. I mean, that is the, the answer. So there you go. That is a proof of Kramer's rule. So what are the, you know, what's the limitation of Kramer's rule? Why didn't I lead with this? I mean, isn't this fantastic? We just, got, I mean, there's a formula, right? This is why engineers love it. It's not a, it's not a process. It's not some sort of complicated list of laundry list of mathematical things to do to something. No, you, you take the equations, you shove in the numbers. That's the answer. Plug and chug, right? What are the limitations? Why don't we just do this method every, every time? You guys tell me? Why is Gaussian elimination so much better than this for numerical problems? Yeah? Fractions get ugly and aren't always even allowed. True, but we can have fractions with the Gaussian elimination too. How about, what if the determinant's not zero, right? Are there problems, that are, are there applied problems with determinant coefficient matrices that are zero, that are interesting? Oh yes, there are many. <laughs> so that, that's a very unfair assumption. Now that's a, that's a reasonable assumption for most like circuit problems, for example. Circuit problems typically have a unique answer, a lot of them, depending on how you ask though. If you leave a certain ambiguity in the circuit, it might be that there's multiple circuits that satisfy the partial data. Then Kramer's rule won't help you. Not at least entirely. The other thing is, n equations and n unknowns. Who says that that should be the problem? What if we have three equations and two unknowns, or four equations and five unknowns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? What if the number of equations and number of unknowns don't match? Kramer's rule, no help. And yet Kramer's rule is important. This is how we prove, for example, variation of parameters formulas in differential equations. Uh, variation of parameters is, so some, if you've had differential equations, you've learned undetermined coefficients, this sort of sneaky guessing and checking and plugging in, right? And that will work for a lot of cases, but the more general method is variation of parameters, and the nth order variation of parameters rests on Kramer's rule. You actually have to solve a symbolic problem with Kramer's rule. Um, generally speaking, anytime I have a symbolic system of n equations and, unknow and unknowns, Kramer's rule of often will find me a nice formula for like a symbolic problem. That's where I find myself using it more than, more than anything else. <clears throat> and then there's another reason not to like Kramer's rule, which is just the numerics of it. Kramer's rule is very costly. It, it requires that you calculate the determinant of the coefficient matrix. How many steps is that? Three. 
We've seen it in the expansion by cofactors, right? If you, if you study that, you'll see that there's something like an n factorial thing going on there. We've already seen that. For the 2 by 2 matrix, you've got two things. For the 3 by 3 matrix, you've got six things. 4 by 4 by 4 matrix, you've got 24 things. That's, that's factorial, 4 factorial. 5 by 5 matrix has something like the sum of 120 distinct terms. By the time you get to 10, don't want to talk about it. So you've got to calculate the determinant of the coefficient matrix here. What else do you got to do? You have to calculate the determinants of all these other various assorted, sundry, also n by n matrices, right? Now maybe you can get lucky and come up with some sort of sneaky numerical method which cuts down the, cuts down the static there for some given particular problem, but uh, you know, you're looking at a bunch of n factorial type calculations there. Th those are very costly. Gaussian elimination, on the other hand, if you study it carefully, goes like something like n squared or n cubed, I forget. I'm not a numerical, ask Dr. Wang, he can tell you for sure. But the um, Gaussian elimination works on something more like a polynomial rate of convergence as compared to factorial. So, you know, Gaussian elimination wins every way you can think of. But Kramer's rule is great for symbolic things. Here's the other thing it's, it's wonderful for. And then I'll work some problems, okay? But one, one other theoretical tidbit that I should share with you. I won't prove this one today. There's a good proof in the notes, but... Um, Kramer's rule can be used to derive the following formula for A inverse, you know, of course we, we need to be given what? A is square, right, over a field. We, of course, we need the determinant of A is not equal to zero, right? But here's the formula for the, formula for the inverse. A inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of A times the, the classical of a joint of A transposed. So this is sometimes called the classical of joint. I've noticed that the new linear algebra books are tending to call this the adjugate, which is a probably a language I should adopt. I just haven't in the current set of notes. You've already seen this. So what's the adjoint, right? <laughs> so the adjoint, uh, classical adjoint of A, is the following. It is... Um, oh, curses, I, all of a sudden I've forgotten. Ah! I was trying to print out my notes for this very reason, and I didn't get it sent to the secretary in time, and my notes, the printed out part of my notes stops just before this. <laughs> so forgive me, it's not one of those things I remember. And I, I know I have a, a certain, there's a 50-50 chance I'll write it down wrong. So, all right, so let's see here. It is formed by the determinants of suitable Submatrices of A. Let me try to be more. Let me start with an example. <laughs> so if I if I have A is uh, you know A B C D E F G H I. All right. I'll try to write down the adjoint for this for you guys. A D J of A. So to get the 1, 1 spot, what you do is you delete the first column and first row, and you take the determinant of the remaining part of the matrix. So it's, it's the determinant of um, e -H -E -E -F -H -I. All right. And then, um, then what do you do? 
like this one, will be, the next one will be the determinant of, so I'm deleting the first row, second column, so it's D, F, G, I. Determinant of um, D, E, A, D, G, H, all right, et cetera. Eventually, the last one down here would be the determinant of what, if you understand the pattern. Actually, this is actually not yet, so sorry, this is actually not yet. This is the matrix of cofactors. This is, in, in fact, not the uh, adjugate yet. So that would be A, B, D, E. So this I would sometimes call something like M, um, matrix of cofactors. And what's, what's um, the um, classical adjoint then is, is um, well, the ijth component of that is minus 1 to the i plus j mij. So you take the matrix of cofactors and then you slap on all these signs, appropriate, the plus minuses. So with that in mind, you can see that like the adjoint of the matrix I just wrote down would be something like EI minus HF, right? And then the second one we multiply by minus because this, is get, this picks up a, the sign of minus 1 in the, the spot here because we got 1 plus 2, which is 3. So that ends up being FG minus DI. And then this one would be dh minus G, ge, and so forth. All right. After all of that, you transpose that. Divide by the determinant. That's the formula for the inverse. So you see why we don't memorize the formula for the 3 by 3 inverse? Does it make sense to you now why we don't do that? Yeah? How does this work out? What's it look like for the 2 by 2 case? That's actually worth doing. I'll do it over here. If I have A equals to, you know, A, B, C, D, what's my matrix of cofactors? The cofactor matrix is just, um, so I, I got D, um, C, B, A, then the adjugate of that, D minus C minus B, A, and then transpose that, what you got? D minus B minus C, A, divide by the determinant. There you go, that's our 2 by 2 uh, inverse formula. And this is the most base case of this general so-called, it's a formula for the inverse matrix, the so-called classical adjoint formula. And it's important to know about this because it's nice to know that you can at least in principle find a straight stone cold formula for the inverse matrix in terms of polynomials of the coefficients in the matrix. This is a nice thing to know going forward at various points in the theory. That said, this is not something we want to calculate with, right? I mean, if you want to calculate the inverse of a 3 by 3, goodness gracious, certainly we want to what? We should take the matrix, put the identity next to it, row reduction until we get i times the inverse, right? Like we talked about before. All right, let me, this is a, a good time for me to project a couple things. If 
I can find my... Aha! So, you know, I've got some questions in the homework while I'm waiting for this thing to warm up. I've got some questions in the homework about the wedge product, you may have noticed, right? And I would also remind you that the homework has, this is a built-in bonus, right? So if you don't get everything done, you can still make 100. But some of you want to, and it's good, because you never know what's going to happen on a test, right? Um, so here's an example of a wedge product calculation. If you've got something like E1 plus E2 wedged with, say, E3 plus E2, the way this works is you just distribute. So it's like E1 wedge E3 um, plus E1 wedge E2 plus E2 wedge E3 plus E2 wedge E2. And this wedge, it doesn't go away. It's some formal thing you can do with vectors to make a new object. So the wedge product of two vectors is a two vector. It's not a vector again, it's a, it's a two vector, which, you know, is a new thing. I'm just treating it, treating it abstractly. Um, and um, the thing I do tell you, though, is first of all, it behaves like normal. The arithmetic behaves like normal, like this, distributes. But the other kind of wrinkle is that if you have the wedge product of anything with itself, a vector with itself, then this is zero. So that's the main thing you need to know, is that when you flip things, like if I have A wedge B, if those are vectors, then that's minus B wedge A. That's the kind of the interesting new thing. It's an associative product. It distributes across addition. You can pull scalars out. That should be pretty much all you need to do, you need to know to do those homework problems. The answers will involve wedges. It's not like some secret formula like, oh, E1 wedge E3. I, uh, I look up my secret table of how we do wedge products, and it works out to like 2E2 or something. That's not it. I mean, it remains E1 wedge E3. It's an object in its own right. It stays there. There's a natural interplay between these wedge products and um, vectors, and that's part of the homework is to show you how that goes. In particular, I show you that the wedge product plus a natural correspondence links two vectors to the cross to the wedge product of two one one vectors. So the wedge product is a way actually we can do cross products and also dot products in a kind of sneaky abstract way. It's also a different formalism which would allow you to prove things about determinants. The wedge product has the same essential anti-symmetry as our formula for the determinant. This fact that you can, you know, when you switch two, two columns, you get a minus. That's just like this wedge product. That's the one thing I forgot to tell you guys today, um, and the, the thing that's missing from my discussion so far. There's one other big calculational thing with determinants, row operations you can calculate the determinants by row operations. Now, I had, think I have intentionally not asked you any questions that force you to do that. So you can get by without it. But if you learn it, that's another tool in your arsenal. Um, I'm just saying, for example, um, what would happen if you switched a row? How would that change the determinant? Yeah, flips the sign. What happens if you multiply a row by a non? Like if I take a row and I multiply by three, how does that change the determinant? I just, I just multiplied the determinant by 3, right? So to be fair, I'd have to divide by 3, the answer I'm looking for. And you can also sort through the type 3 row operation, I think, just doesn't change the determinant. So those three things put together mean that you can do Gaussian elimination on a matrix, and if you keep track of signs and multiples, you can learn the value of the determinant by doing row reduction. I'll try to do one in the help session tomorrow just to show you what the world I'm talking about. Um, so here, here guys, here are the, uh, the cofactors. Um, the cofactors are the, that's the, 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 ma the I, I'm sorry, M is not the cofactor. I don't know what M is. M is the, I don't know what M is. These, these are minus one to the I plus J times the MIJ. I mean, I've put the signs in here, see, plus, minus. Anyway, here, here you go. These are the components of the, um, the adjugate, the classical adjoint. And um, there it is. There's your formula for the 3 by 3 inverse <laughs> in all of its glory. Um, 
Is there many applications to the determinant? Actually, let me go back and show you Kramer's rule before I get off track here. First of all, garden variety, plain Jane system problem. Suppose I want to solve um, AX equal to B with A being 1, 3, 2, 8 and B being 1, 5. How do you do Kramer's rule? Very simple. X1, first of all, what's the, what's the determinant of the coefficient matrix? It's 8 minus 6, which is 2. Then I need to figure out what's the determinant of my, my A1 and my A2. Um, you know, so let's see here. I swapped out the first column for 1, 5, right? So there you go. X1 is minus 7 halves. And here I swapped out the second column for 1, 5 instead of 3, 8. That gives me 5 minus 2, which is 3. So 3 halves. So minus 7 halves, 3 halves. There you go. That's the solution. It is way, way faster to just solve and substitute, right? Or multiply by inverse. I mean, I don't know. I did find Kramer's rule helpful for myself in my brief stint in electrical engineering. Like, it was useful for me when I had systems um, that involved three or four equations. It's a nice thing to crack the system because if you can find if you can find one of the solutions, then that reduces the problem from being four equations, four unknowns, to like three equations, three unknowns. And then once you find one of the solutions, then you can put that into the remaining things and it becomes lower dimensional. So there's like a combination of Kramer's rule and back substitution for actual numerical problems is sometimes actually productive. So some of my um, hand wringing about the n factorial is really disingenuous for honest to goodness applied problems because you don't, use, you don't just use plain Kramer's rule. You use some kind of mixture of that and other methods. Right. Um, <clears throat> this is the um, a, a non-homogeneous system of differential equations. Looks like this: dx dt is equal to ax plus f. These are actually a matrix of unknown functions. This is an n by n matrix of numbers. Um, so this is system of differential equations, non-homogeneous system of differential equations, and um, you can find something called the solution matrix x, which is a matrix of solutions. Each column is a solution. Um, the determinant of that will be non-zero. Then you can go looking for a solution formed by um, x times v. When you do that, it leads to the problem of solving x times dv dt equal to f. But this is exactly a symbolic problem where we have this matrix of unknown functions x, we have this vector of unknowns dv dt, and we have a given function f. So you can solve that by Kramer's rule. And Kramer's rule tells us that the ith component of the unknown derivative is 1 over the determinant times the, um, you know, the analog of a sub j here, which I call w sub i. And then to find v, just integrate both sides, and there you go. This is the, um, this is the formula for um, <coughs> variation of parameters for systems. It's Kramer's rule. So here's a nice application. Another nice application is to the theory of partial differentiation. Um, and you have homework problems like this, all right? So I, I walk you through these steps for the homework problem. So suppose you wanted to differentiate you know, a system of equations. You've got x plus y plus z plus w equal to 3. And uh, x squared, curse the cursor, minus uh, 2xyz plus w cubed equal to 5. Um, and so I want to calculate partial derivatives of z and w with respect to independent variables x and y. So this kind of problem comes up in thermodynamics where you've got many, many state variables. You've got a couple of state equations which link them, you know, and you want to figure out one set of variables as dependent on another. The question then becomes how do you cal calculate partial derivatives with respect to an independent set of variables, you know, versus a a chosen dependent set. And um, there's usually some physical interpretation that tells you which two variables you should choose as dependent versus independent and so forth. Um, once you make that choice, though, Kramer's rule helps you sort through things. So here it is. Um, so first of all, to find the relation of the differentials, you just take the total derivative of both of these. If you had Calc 3, you know what I'm talking about. It's not a big deal. Differentiate this, you get that. Differentiate that, you get that. I don't ask you to do that in your homework. I do that for you service I provide. Um, and then I'm trying to solve for dz and dw. So what that means 
is I put all the dz and w stuff on one side, and I put all the other dx, dy on the other side. This is the mysterious star, star, star part of your homework problem I refer to. This is the analog of that re, 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 resorting of differentials, putting the, you know, the dz, dy on one side and the dx, dy on the other. Then I rewrite that as a linear equation. In the differentials, these are my unknowns and my matrix of functions. And here's my given in homogeneous term, which I can then solve with Kramer's rule. So to solve for dz, I take the determinant of, see what I do? I just swap out the first column for the inhomogeneous term, swap out the second column. Oh, I don't swap out the second column, leave it, leave it put, put, take the determinant, bam, that's dz. Then the neat thing is the meaning of the coefficients, the coefficients that is exactly the partial derivative of z with respect to x holding y fixed, this is the partial derivative of z with respect to, to y holding x fixed. And so I can calculate partial derivatives by Kramer's rule in this sense. This you did not learn in calculus three because you didn't take it with me. And I've probably become crazy, not so crazy as to cover this in calculus three these days. A few years ago, you'd have seen me doing this in calculus three. But, you know, I give students less for their money these days. So, um, and here's the Kramer's rule for W. This gives us partial derivatives of, w, partial derivatives of w with respect to X and Y. So there's a homework problem. Th don't, don't be scared. I mean, this is a very, just, it's just Kramer's rule with the extra interpretation. It's really not a hard homework problem, that problem I'm talking about. Well, I guess that's just about it for today. I will just leave you with this one passing thought in this uh, most holy day of, uh, you know, unrealistically exaggerated romanticism, you should remember that, you know, people will come and go, they'll let you down, they may or may not remain in your life, but the one thing is sure, math will be there. <laughs> Whatever you do to math, it'll still be right there waiting for you, come back to, just a thought. It's my wisdom for the day. <laughs>